This morning, um, we have Dr. Maya Gross here to present Grand Rounds. Um, she uh, completed her bachelor's degree in Spanish at Cornell um, and then had a year working as a Spanish medical interpreter in Minneapolis, which I did not know. Um, she attended medical school at Tulane um, and earned a combined MD PhD there. She's currently our chief resident of education. Um, her, uh, sorry, MD, MPH, sorry. I have to downgrade you just a little bit. I was gonna take it. <laughs> um, uh, she is now our chief resident of education and her research interests include quality improvement um, and addressing disparities in obstetrics and gynecology. And as most of us probably know, she will be uh, beginning fellowship training in GYN oncology at the University of Washington in Seattle after this. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gross. Good morning, everybody. It's really nice to see a lot of your faces in person for the first time in a few years at Grand Rounds. Um, can everyone see the screen okay? Speak up if you can't on the Zoom call. I think I can speak for most of my co-residents when I say that the thought of leaving residency in six months and beginning to work as a real doctor, as a real OBGYN is daunting. Prior to making the decision to go into fellowship, I often wondered if I would be ready, if I had encountered enough scenarios to be prepared to take care of my patients as well as they deserved. I've learned so much in the last three and a half years, yet I feel a little relief now knowing that I can push that big jump in re responsibility down the line a little bit further as I enter fellowship. My interest in this topic stems from that apprehension as well as a desire to understand what makes my surgical teachers so effective and how to cultivate those skills. I have no disclosures. Throughout this talk, we'll learn about the history of surgical education in the United States, the concept of coaching in medicine and how this been, has been applied and studied. We'll discuss surgical coaching in a formal training environment versus after entering independent practice. And we'll discuss some methodology and resources for surgical coaching. Surgery and surgical education in the United States have a relatively short history. While surgery has been practiced for millennia, surgical education as we know it has been around for less than a century. In the early days after European immigrants began arriving to what is now the United States, formerly trained doctors were very rare. Most medical education relied solely on an apprenticeship model when pupils could find a willing practitioner to shadow. At the dawn of surgical education in the United States, admissions into medical school and surgical practice required only an ability to pay tuition, and medical schools were not viewed as respected centers of higher education. Many students at early medical colleges were illiterate, which gave administrators pause when written formal tests were proposed. This painting is titled The Gross Clinic. It was painted in 1875 by the American painter Thomas Eakins. It gives us a small window into surgical education in the US only 150 years ago. Notice the students and observers in the audience. Notice the lack of gloves or gowns. In 1875, ether anesthesia was common, but the practice of antiseptics and preventing infection in the operating room were not. The main physician, Dr. Gross, wears a black coat, which was typically kept in the operating room and reused with every operation, only washed when necessary. This next painting was done by the same artist 14 years later. It's titled The Agnew Clinic. You can see that over this time lapse, there's been a change in attire with surgical gowns and some attempt at sterility. There's also a dedicated nurse in the operating room. Our American surgical education system was closely modeled on the German system. A pyramidal model of resident surgical education was introduced by William Halstead after he joined John, Johns Hopkins in 1892. This system in which eight surgeons would enter, four would advance after the first year, and then one would become a house surgeon with the others on backup if you were to fall ill or be unable to complete the program, fostered intense competition and no guarantee of advancement. Halstead was one of the founding fathers of Johns Hopkins, was a surgical pioneer, was a known cocaine and morphine addict, and is credited with the educational principle of see one, do one, teach one. Pillars of this educational system were a master apprentice model, close patient contact, research, and graduated responsibility. The rectangular model of surgical education that we're familiar with 
only became widespread after World War II in the 1940s, when there was a recognized need for an increased number of practicing physicians. The structural hierarchy of surgical education began to take shape at this time, when each service of house surgeons consisted of senior, junior, pup, and etherizer, with graduated responsibilities over 16 months of medical school. By 1935, the length of surgical education increased to three years. The first standardized national guidelines for surgical training were published by the American College of Surgeons in 1939 as the fundamental requirements for graduate training in surgery. The current ACGME was not created until 2000 to coordinate and oversee independent residency review committees. I bring up this short history discussion to remind us all that the surgical education model that we consider to be traditional or standard today is relatively new and that surgical education in the United States has changed drastically in every decade since its beginning. The way we've always done things isn't really the way we've always done things. Surgical education has, however, consistently relied upon a master and apprentice model grounded in the passage of knowledge from an expert surgeon to a pupil. With that in mind, we'll transition to our main topic, surgical coaching. This historical perspective spurs a reflection of where we're at now when it comes to surgical education. When I originally thought of this topic, I was envisioning most of the talk being centered on surgical coaching in formal training environments like residency or fellowship. With more exploration of the literature, I realized that many, if not most publications and initiatives surrounding surgical coaching are targeted at physicians entering or already in practice. Why is this? The system that we currently have in place involves OBGYN residency, during which time residents spend between 18 to 24 months of their training in a gynecologic surgical setting. Some may go to fellowship and then all physicians will get board certified and begin practicing. Once in practice, there's limited emphasis on further surgical education. After graduating from residency or fellowship, continuing medical education largely consists of reading articles, attending lectures, and possibly attending skills workshops. On top of this, many of the steps that are in place for surgeons entering um, independent practice are aimed at competency and the ability to operate independently rather than on continued improvement. When I was preparing for this lecture, I was thinking about the ways that I've observed new practicing physicians get certified to operate in different hospital systems. The interactions that I've witnessed include an observational model with a partner surgeon in the room observing but rarely offering suggestions for improvement. I also spoke with my friends and colleagues that have recently graduated um, from training and begun practicing in different surgical centers around the country. Attendings new to practice are typically proctored for a set number of cases to ensure competency and their ability to operate independently. These proctored sessions aren't geared towards teaching. And after this certification, it's rare to get any kind of formal teaching or surgical mentorship from your colleagues. It's also rare to operate with other physicians or observe other physicians operating. Surgeons typically operate with scrub techs, residents, and fellows, all of those dynamics which aren't tailored towards offering feedback to the, the primary surgeon. Only if specifically requested for a hard case do surgeons typically bring a partner to operate. And even when this happens, the dynamic is more of a, I'm just here if you need me, rather than how can we help each other be better. So why does coaching and continued education matter. Studies have shown that while graduates of obstetrics and gynecology programs have high confidence in their own surgical skills, fellowship program directors think that incoming trainees are less qualified and prepared to um, operate independently than their trainees were 10 years prior. Studies have also shown that our personal assessment of our own performance is often distorted in either direction. We either think that we're underperforming or overperforming compared to what we're actually doing. Humans are notoriously bad at understanding and being objective about their own strengths and weaknesses. So while it's possible to help yourself excel and push your, oh, <laughs> sneak peek. While it's possible to push yourself to excel and help yourself towards improvement, you're also likely missing key opportunities without having a second pair of eyes. Changes in the field of obstetrics and gynecology in the last couple of decades, including work hours limitations, changing surgical volumes with a move to minimally invasive surgery and increased availability of medical management for abnormal uterine bleeding or other conditions has also changed the amount of time that practicing surgeons get to spend in the operating room after graduating. 
surgical coaching is a potential way to bridge the gap from training to practice and foster a lifetime improvement and maintenance of skills. So what's the difference between the model that we have of training and certification and a model of coaching? The pivotal difference is the distinction between a focus on competence versus excellence or versus a personal best. In our resident clinic preoperative HNP templates, one of the sections in our assessment and plan is delineating what the patient's goal of surgery is. This often goes along the lines of reduce or eliminate vaginal bleeding, have a healthy baby, discover the cause of my pain. This is followed by the procedure that we're planning, minimally invasive hysterectomy, repeat C-section, diagnostic laparoscopy. Competency would be defined as performing this procedure, achieving the patient's outcome without causing undue harm to the patient. Seeking a personal best or having a mental model of constant improvement inherently includes the components of competency, but adds extra goals and desired outcomes, which can have downstream effects, such as, can you minimize the amount of time that you need to complete surgery? Downstream effects of this would include decreasing the cost of utilization of the operating room, decreasing the burden on the healthcare system of labor and resource management, reducing the time which the patient spends under anesthesia, which can reduce their risk of complications from surgery. You can also minimize your amount of bleeding, optimize which instruments you're using and decrease the amount of time you need to switch instruments. Or can you optimize your own ergonomics, your interpersonal communication in the operating room? ACGME required minimums, board certification and maintenance are directed at achieving competency for graduating residents, which is extremely important to make sure that we're, we're sending out physicians who can practice independently and coaching aims at achieving these elevated goals. Despite these things, surgeons are expected to be experts of their skill sets at the time that they enter independent practice. For many, the viewpoint is that by becoming board certified and graduating from training, we've demonstrated our skills. So why would any of us masters of our domain need a coach? Here are a few other people who have decided that they needed a coach. In the top right is Oprah on a Zoom call with her life coach, Martha Beck. We have Rafael Nadal, one of, if not the best tennis players of all time with his long-term tennis coach. We have America's queen, Beyonce, and young Leonardo DiCaprio who have worked with acting and vocal coaches throughout their careers. And then to keep the sports fans interested, we have celebrated Green Bay Packers coach Vince Lombardi. If these people who are arguably already extremely good at their jobs felt the need to use coaches, why don't we in medicine? The image in my first slide of a surgeon scrubbing in with his coach behind him running plays comes from an article written by Atul Gawande in the New Yorker in 2011. The article is titled Personal Best. It discusses how the concept of coaches and coaching is widespread and routine for experts in various fields. All of the people on the previous screen have used coaches even at the peak of their career to maintain and improve their skill sets. Coaching is the norm in athletics, the arts, business. The business of life coaching is booming. There are even a myriad of coaches on TikTok to help you become the influencer you've always dreamed of. In his article, Dr. Gawande discusses his journey with coaching, which he embarked upon about a decade into practice when he noticed that his skills were at a plateau. He saw significant improvements in his own surgical skills and operative performance, including a decreased rate of surgical complications after he incorporated routine coaching into his practice. I would highly recommend reading this article after this grand rounds. It's fascinating, it's well-written, and it's inspiring. As some of you may know, I don't have a terribly keen interest in most sporting events, but I was a track runner in high school. I still run, and when I'm training for something, I have this burned in memory of my track coach in high school standing at the third corner of the track, which is the most demoralizing corner of the track, telling me to pick up my feet, turn over, and take smaller steps. He was there supporting me, but also pushing me to optimize my performance in each race. This brings me to my next question. What is a coach? How does this master and apprentice model differ from coaching and why does it matter? Um, to understand this difference, we have to understand what we mean when we talk about coaching. In the literature on surgical education, coaching and teaching are often used interchangeably <clears throat> and terminology surrounding teaching in medical education is varied without clear delineation of roles. So it's confusing. Att attributes of coaching and coaches consist of individualized in-time feedback on observed behavior combined with pointed observations to optimize performance. Coaching adds to an existing skill set, helping develop new behaviors or approaches rather than focusing on knowledge transmission alone. 
Techniques for coaching are varied, but all coaches encourage self-reflection, exploration, and self-betterment. Coaches prioritize the goal of the coachee and avoid prioritizing their own agendas or preferences. This places the responsibility on the learner. The coach drives dis the coachee drives discovery and personal growth, and the coach facilitates the process. Coaching is only successful and can only work if the participant is invested. Ideally, participants elect and choose to be coached and are motivated to improve. Coaching can focus on an individual or a team. Timing of coaching relationships can be varied with some being lifelong and others only a few interactions. Successful coaching inherently involves a relationship that's built on trust and mutual respect. Coaches usually have experience or expertise in the field of interest. They may not be expert practitioners themselves, but they have a detailed understanding of the game. Coaching focuses on formative rather than summative feedback. And often there are many cycles of feedback with adjustments in each iteration. In Dr. Gawande's article, he said it beautifully, which is that coaches speak with credibility, make personal connections and focus little on themselves. This is a Venn diagram from a recently published AJOG article focusing on surgical coaching, and it demonstrates the differences and interconnectedness of the various roles that medical educators can play. Compared with coaching, teachers have a specific skill set or set of information that they want to convey to a learner or a group of learners, and the learner is supposed to retain that information for the future. Teaching usually occurs in a structured setting with, it, with discrete questions and answers over a set amount of time. The assessment in teaching is both formative and summative. Relationship with mentors are usually more vulnerable and confidential. Mentors are usually helping with long-term goal setting, career or life planning. The relationship with your mentor focuses on advice and counseling, and there may not be clear or set desired outcomes. There's no assessment or knowledge of skills in the mentorship relationship. As we travel from teacher to coach to mentor, the learner has increased responsibility and increased amount of driving the goals. So when should we coach versus teaching? In residency, teaching and coaching often occur simultaneously, and the role educators may play can oscillate quickly between these roles. For new interns on labor and delivery or on gynonc rounds, there's a lot of teaching and probably less coaching that's happening as we learn how to do a completely new set of tasks with a completely new set of information. Later on during procedures, which the learner has performed multiple times before, a coaching mentality might be more productive. What makes a good surgical coach and how do we pick a good surgical coach? In the last 15 years, there's been a rising um, interest in the field of surgical education with multiple studies ranging from observational studies to randomized controlled trials, looking at various ways to incorporate coaching into surgery and to figure out how to optimize surgical coaching. One of the really interesting questions is who we should be picking as coaches and how to optimize these interactions to improve our outcomes. Coaches need to be trained. Excellence doesn't necessarily make a good coach. It's important that the coach has received formal training in the principles and philosophy of coaching. The participant should be driving the relationship and the coaching relationship should not be based on a traditional hierarchy of medicine. There's considerable debate about crossover and specialties of practice between coaches and coachees. Some advocate for pairs coming from the same specialty. Some advocate for the same general specialty, but maybe a different subspecialty between the pairs. And then some think that different specialties altogether should be coaching pairs. The data is mixed, but seems to point towards optimized outcomes when coaching pairs have a similar but not exact same scope of practice. This allows them to have familiarity with what they're doing, but shifts the relationship away from preferences of specific steps or things that the coach prefers and shifts it more towards um, the coach's goals. Coaches also don't have to be surgeons. There's multiple studies that have looked at non-surgical or non-surgeon skills coaches coaching surgical tasks. They've been briefed on the expectations for the task and they know how it should be performed. And these are equally effective in a simulating setting, simulated setting as trained surgeons. So non-physician coaches can be used in specific scenarios as well. There's also a question about the level of coaching, whether it should be peer-to-peer -peer coaching or expert level coaching, and both can be really valuable. 
Peer-to-peer coaching can be and is often bi-directional with studies demonstrating an exchange of ideas that's mutually beneficial for both participants and both participants coming out of the interactions having felt like they learned something. Expert level coaching can be particularly useful for surgeons aiming to acquire new skills or integrate new technology into the operating room. And for younger or newly out of practice surgeons, um, you might consider pairing them with a more experienced or expert learning coach. Both of these models require faculty development to encourage participants to adhere to the principles of surgical coaching rather than transitioning into relationships like teacher or mentor, which may feel more comfortable for us. Um, studies have also looked at how to select or criteria for selection, with some studies using a peer nomination model where colleagues pick people in their practice that they think would make good surgical coaches. Another study chose the top performing 15 surgeons in the group based on risk adjusted surgical outcomes, and in that study all 15 of those surgeons agreed to participate and were interested. There's been studies looking at personality type and congruence of that between the coaching pairs. And the one study that looked at that essentially didn't really find that it matters that much. In the initial coaching interaction, um, pairs that have similar personality styles might have a more positive first interaction, but over time that, that effect dissipates and the outcomes are similar. They've also looked at whether sex congruence between the partners matters and again, found no difference in outcomes. Location of practice is something to just consider if you're planning to do an in-person surgical coaching model, um, but doesn't matter when you do video-based surgical coaching. I next wanted to talk about facilitators and barriers to surgical coaching. Like we've mentioned, relationship building is essential. Ultimately, the success of your coaching interaction comes down to the ability to establish a trusting relationship that's centered on the goals of the coachee. Many studies emphasize the importance of having a meeting, either in-person or virtual, um, between the coach and the coachee prior to the first actual session so that they can feel comfortable when they're doing the actual coaching. It's important to stick to a coaching mentality of collaborative analysis, peer support, and constructive feedback. And then also it's important to follow through. After coaching sessions, the most effective coaching pairs circled back on originally set goals. Some barriers to implementation of surgical coaching is the fear of stigma. And I think this is one of the biggest ones. Um, many studies cited participants or potential participants being unwilling or reluctant to participate um, out of a fear for their loss of authority in the operating room, fear of what others would think. In Dr. Gawande's article on surgical coaching, he also talks about an awkward encounter where his surgical coach was in the operating room and his patient asked him who that person was and he told them he had a coach and they seemed very disturbed by that. Um, some other barriers are, um, like we've mentioned, emphasis on the coach's preferences. Um, agenda, agenda setting based on coaching preferences prioritizes the coach's goals. In one study, when coaching sessions didn't align with the coachee's goals, it was always related to the coach directing most of their feedback towards technical skills when the coachee had asked or specified that they wanted to focus on more non-technical skills in the operating room. Again, that probably comes back to that's what we're most comfortable giving in terms of feedback in the operating room. Logistical barriers, including implementation of technology and then location for coaching pairs can be a barrier to coaching. Um, the time commitment that it can take with it requiring training before the coaching sessions and follow up. Failure to goal set prior to surgery can lead to sort of unorganized coaching interactions and then sticking to a traditional hierarchy is also detrimental to coaching. So what kind of things can we coach? There's multiple domains of um, surgical coaching and things that are amenable to surgical coaching. The First one that we think about is technical skills. So under that, um, we can coach on operative time, technical errors, time to competence, or time to proficiency in a skill, economy of motion, and the number of movements used during surgery, utilization of instruments, ergonomics, and then bimanual dexterity. Non-technical skills are actually more often requested as goals of coaching by surgical coaches and include situational awareness, um, handling distractions in the operating room, stress management in the operating room, communication and interpersonal relations with OR staff or other surgical learners, mitigation of delays in the operating room. 
there's actually a um, standardized program or process for judging non-technical skills for surging. Um, for surgeons and they rate cognitive and interpersonal skills. And one study using this standardized thing showed that scores peaked in fellowship and declined thereafter, specifically in the areas of establishing a shared understanding with people in the operating room, implementing and reviewing decisions and coping with pressure. These findings highlight the need for ongoing learning and dedicated practice in all elements of operative performance throughout the surgeon's careers. Um, coaching has also been studied for doctor well-being and resilience. Deficiencies in both technical and non-technical components of surgery have been consistently associated with outcomes, including surgical time, post-operative complications. Coaching in medicine is a relatively new topic with all of the available articles published on surgical coaching after 2008. I wanted to focus on a few specific studies that highlight different ways in which coaching can be employed. The most recent systematic review identified 23 studies on coaching in medicine. And before we go into specific examples, we'll just talk about a few big picture takeaways. The first one is that video-based surgical coaching among, among surgical trainees improved technical performance compared with traditional master apprenticeship models. Coaching for technical skills has more robust evidence for success in coaching in medicine. However, there are promising results for coaching in non-technical skills. Many of the domains of coaching are often addressed simultaneously during a coaching session. And when coaches are dissatisfied with their coaching interaction, it's almost always because the coach doesn't focus on the goals of the coachee. And like I mentioned, this is almost always because the coach is focusing on the technical aspects when the coach, coachee wants to focus on non-technical aspects. Coach participants sometimes have increased time in completion of tasks when they're originally incorporating new coaching um, feedback, but they do consistently have decreased errors and improved outcomes for technical performance and that increased time dissipates with time. Um, now I wanna go over a few specific examples of programs that have been successful. The first one is the SCOPE program, which is called the Surgical Coaching for Operative Performance Enhancement. This is an in-person coaching model with one-to-one -one coaching pairs. It was conducted at four academic medical centers across the country. The intervention consisted of coaches being trained in a three-hour surgical coaching workshop, followed by an in-person coaching session with the coach attending the surgical procedure. They conducted preoperative goal setting, intraoperative observation, and then postoperative debriefing, and the debriefing occurred within three days of the surgery. Coaches don't offer intraoperative guidance or feedback while you're operating, and they're not scrubbed in. They used net promoter scores, which are asking people how likely are you to recommend this to your colleagues, which were uniformly high throughout this interaction. Key themes from this study included the impact of the initial coaching interaction. First impressions were important for success of the quality of the coaching interactions. There was also an improvement in perceived quality and value in the interactions over time as the pairs got to know each other better. This study uh, cited the importance of clinical background. They had improved satisfaction with increased clinical overlap between the coaching pairs and emphasized relationship building with the value of debriefs, commitment to the project and transparency regarding intention. Barriers cited in the study were stigma, concern for loss of autonomy and perceived incompetence. The second example I wanted to talk about is the Wisconsin Surgical Program. This is a video-based coaching program um, where coaches would record operations that they chose and then send them to their surgical coaches. This was conducted here at UW-Madison and was developed with the Wisconsin Surgical Society. The population of coaches were board eligible or certified surgeons. Participants varied in years of experience, practice setting, and specialty. The population of coaches were peer nominated surgeons, all of which had at least 15 years of experience. The coaches were trained in a four hour training session and the intervention was a peer coaching model. They again had an introductory session to establish rapport during which time the participant identified their goals. Interpersonal goals were the most common thing cited as wanting to be worked on by the coaches and most, mostly related to teaching learners and interacting with other OR staff. The video recorded operations were then reviewed together by the coaching pair and surgeons got to choose the operations that they recorded. They did a series of one hour review sessions occurring within one month of the surgery. The pairs were matched by specialty, coachee preferences, practice setting and geography. Key themes here were the importance of goal alignment and the concurrent emphasis on multiple coaching domains. 
Coaches and coaches were highly satisfied with this program. One participant was quoted as saying, I truly believe that this should be the model for practice development. I feel like the normalization of the coach and coachee program would be beneficial to every surgeon. The last specific example that I wanted to talk about is a virtual reality and simulation type coaching model. This was done for virtual reality laparoscopic cholecystectomy and was conducted in the UK. The population of coaches were laparoscopic novices and the population of coaches were experienced laparoscopic surgeons. The intervention included all of the laparoscopic novices being um, baseline tested and then trained to competence on a virtual reality laparoscopic cholecystectomy curriculum. After they were all deemed to be competent, they were then randomized on a one-to-one -one basis towards video-based coaching by a surgeon versus a traditional learning model where they revert, reviewed surgical videos in between. Then their performance was judged on porcine models when they conducted multiple laparoscopic cholecystectomies after. Results of this study show that the groups were similar at baseline and they were similar after their first virtual reality laparoscopic cholecystectomy. After each subsequent attempt, the intervention group outperformed the control group on all scales and that difference widened with time and the amount of coaching sessions that they had. And the intervention subjects did take longer than controls in the first post-coaching session, but that time um, difference again dissipated by the end. This was using a GROW model of coaching, which focuses on goals, focused on specific targets that are identified by the client, reality, which is exploring the true nature of the problem via performance review, options, so the coaching pairs formulate effective solutions, targeting the barriers, barriers to surgeons and clients achieving their goals, and then a wrap-up with an action plan for candidates to move towards originally stated goals and examine potential obstacles. Finally, I want to talk about some resources for surgical coaching. The first is the Academy for Surgical Coaching. This was started by Dr. Caprice Greenberg, who is currently at UNC, but was at Wisconsin for a long time, and I'm sure some of you have met. Dr. Suda Pavaluri Kwame, who's also at UW, and then Kara King, who many of you know, um, who's currently the head of the MIGS Fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic. The Academy of Surgical Coaching is a nonprofit that provides surgical coaching services to professional societies, healthcare systems, or individual surgeons. They use a video-based surgical coaching platform. On their website, you can sign up to become a coach and get trained as a surgical coach, or you can connect with a surgical coach for yourself or for your healthcare system. The Surgical Coaching for Operative Performance Scope Program we talked about before, but this is an ongoing program that you can also enroll in. Um, this program partners with departments and hospital systems to implement surgical coaching programs there. This is an in-person surgical coaching system that utilizes the practitioners within the department. Oso Virtual Reality is a real, uh, surgical coaching program that uses a gamification approach to surgical le learning with automated coaching, tracked performance, and proficiency milestones. It also enables remote learning by digitizing the learning journey. Training can be customized by your procedure this was mentioned by Time Magazine in a special mention for the best innovation of 2022. It's directly available to clinicians or via medical device par partnerships. Finally, CSATS is a video-based surgical assessment platform. They have a basic program, which basically just consists of um, a library of surgical videos and then a community that you can collaborate with other surgeons and talk with other surgeons, but they also have an enterprise product that allows for encrypted and HIPAA compliant video capture and upload, AI powered procedure analytics and performance tracking, as well as human insights, including video sharing for peer feedback, actionable expert feedback and objective performance assessments. It also gives you access to a vast library of surgical videos similar to the AGL website. So takeaways from this talk, surgical education is a young field. It has drastically evolved over the last 150 years and will continue to do so. There are variable methods of establishing and fostering coaching relationships, including simulated surgical exercises, video recorded operations in which the coach is not required to be present or in the same practice location, and in-person coaching. Coaching can be employed for a variety of skills related to surgical practice. When starting to prepare for this lecture, my thought was that it would be geared almost entirely towards technical skills coaching, and it's interesting to learn that most participants actually prefer to be coached on non-technical skills. These non-technical skills can include interpersonal, stress management, 
and um, management of delays in the operating room. And successful coaching emphasizes the goals of the coachee and not the agenda of the coach. Thank you all very much for coming to my talk. This picture was taken during a laparoscopic ergonomic simulation session that Dr. Mojdebash and I put together for the residents last year. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you for the excellent talk. I um, recently gave a, a talk at a trauma surgery conference and it was on aviation safety. The checklist is just the beginning. And, um, and the discussion was that in aviation, it's competency-based training versus um, surgery, which is apprenticeship, which she did an excellent job outlining. And um, one of the things that I was, you know, many things I was really impressed with you in particular is that you invest a lot in your own training with regard to simulation and practice. And I was curious, um, do you think we could do better for our trainees by designating time with um, simulation practice, even sort of low level simulation um, where junior residents could be paired with uh, senior residents versus more, you know, kind of book type didactics or what, you know, where do you see that we can invest more in um, this type of training? Yeah, so we here, we do have um, a pretty robust simulation curriculum. Um, some of it's incorporated into our formal didactics on Thursdays where residents do have multiple simulations throughout the year um, focused at different aspects of clinical care. Um, we also incorporate some simulation in our labor and delivery education, but that's actually something that I'm working on with Dr. Lepic and with Gabby Avery to develop a more kind of standardized obstetrics simulation curriculum, which again allows people to practice sort of simulated things in front of their peers and colleagues and then get feedback based on it. Um, we also have 24-7 access to the laparoscopic simulation center or the simulation center, which has laparoscopic boxes and has other things too. And there's an ultrasound um, sim there. And we have 24-7 access to the robot at Meritor, um, which as long as it's not being used for surgery, we can do surgical simulation there. We do have a robotics proficiency simulation, robotics proficiency pathway that includes simulation and most all of the residents are supposed to finish um, sort of the standardized set of um, exercises on the robot before they're allowed to practice on the robot. That being said, I do think there's definitely room for improvement. And I think incorporating a model of peer-to-peer -peer coaching, I think would be really beneficial. Um, and I think one way of doing that would be pairing a senior resident with a junior resident and having them um, dedicate, you know, a few sessions throughout the year to, to guided coaching. The issue with that is time. Um, I think we all know that it's really hard to get people to do things outside of work hours because we're already very busy. And when you add things on um, that aren't really structured in, attendance is usually very low. So I think we could potentially incorporate it in somewhere where it's sort of an expectation, but we do have a very full didactic curriculum already. So it, it would be tricky, but I think it would be really beneficial. Yeah, Dr. Gaston. Um, but I think that the system needs to use more, ex more thank you, more experience, like, you know, doctors as they get uh, in their 40s, 50s, 60s, uh, that are starting to cut back, but have been in the operating room a long time who learned how to either become more efficient or to handle some of the stress. They've seen the aortic injuries or mm -hmm. this, that, and the other. Uh, so I think the healthcare system needs to pull some of these doctors that were competent surgeons out of retirement, if possible, uh, just to have them in the room. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to tell anybody you necessarily a coach. Uh, uh, you know, one of the ways that I learned was uh, I took I took advantage of I was I thought I was a kid, like a kid in a candy store when I was at Northwestern. I could go get any specialist that was one of the best in the world and say, "Hey, I, I want to do a my uh, uh, hysteroscopic myomectomy and teach me how to do that." But your ego has to drop, mm -hmm. and a lot of times, doctors and surgeons. 
the egos are getting in the way of them getting the help that they need. Um, but if you can push that ego out and adopt different strategies that you may not have trained under or whatever the case is, you'll find you actually may be a little better off. Another thing we did was we taped a lot of our surgeries to watch our, our, our cases. And then we studied before surgery. So my wife knew before every Thursday, 20 week uterus, I was gonna be upstairs studying anatomy and I was gonna be looking at the best surgeons on the AAGL at large fibroid uteruses, and different ways of attacking that if the vessels weren't as accessible. Uh, how was I gonna morselate that big 24 week uterus? Uh, so it takes a lot of kind of preparation. It's like, like a football player just doesn't go out on the field. I mean, they prepare with videos and everything before they go. Then they also have a coach, um, and, but they also are willing to adjust. And any sports player that's not willing to adjust doesn't survive, really. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, so I really do think that like people like even like me that I don't do a whole lot of GYN, but I've done so many GYN cases that it would be nothing to go back in the operating room and show people how to get in a vaginal cuff without a lot of bleeding, uh, you know, how to take bulky uteruses and, you know, get them done laparoscopically. Um, but I think we have to have a system of mentorship. Yeah, that, and to a couple of the points that you made, the first one is about continuing education for people already in practice. One of the articles that is in the references here, and you guys can access them if you want to, um, talks about how we spend billions of dollars on continuing medical education in the United States every year, but it's mostly um, attendance of conferences, rare surgical skills workshops, and then reading articles, and how a lot of that money could be redirected towards investing in programs like this for surgical coaching, because one of the main complaints or trepidations that people have is that it's going to cost a lot to implement these programs. Um, so I think that could be really beneficial and probably a lot more beneficial than reading an article that you could read on your own time. Yeah. Um, and then the second one is when you said you don't like people wouldn't have to know that you have the coach in the operating room. I think that's a good point in almost all of these study or in all of these studies, the coach isn't actively giving feedback or advice during the surgery. And so that risk or fear of losing your sense of authority in the operating room, which is probably already a flawed, you know, goal. Um, that isn't really there anyways, because they're not actually giving you feedback or critiquing you in the operating room. They're taking notes and watching or watching your recorded surgeries and then giving you feedback in a private setting. And I've suggested to the educational community that we need to probably tape you all surgeries, like the laparoscopic hysterectomies yeah. and check levels of competence uh, you know, taking down the uterines, uh, you know, the cardinals, getting the vaginal, you know, uh, cuff, you know, all that kind of stuff, because we need to take bias out of it and actually look to see who do we need to improve on and can we sit down and work mm -hmm. on that. We can't do that if we got favorites and all that stuff. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maya. That was an excellent talk and a good reminder that um, we can we need to be lifelong learners through the scope through the spectrum of our practice, our lifespan. Um, one of our one of the questions I have is that uh, you brought up some great points that what a lot of physicians want is more um, training on sort of like what people might call the soft sciences, mm -hmm. like communication like people management, people skills. And one of the deficits I felt for residency education is that you you have to manage people along the course of residency, but you never receive formal training on how to manage people the way, say, an investment banker or someone working in business uh, might receive. So what are your thoughts on, or what have you read about your um, about how we could incorporate things like people management and communication skills and, and that like things like the Harvard business review or, or how do we put that into resident education so that there's a stronger foundation when residents leave the program and go into independent practice? Yeah, I think, I think we do have some, you know, planned didactic sessions that, that talk about that. But again, 
having like 30 minutes or an hour or something once a year isn't super helpful. Um, a lot of these coaching models incorporate those things and, um, you know, include direct observation and then talking about what went right and, and what didn't go right. And I think that like a coaching model could be really beneficial for that. And if we had a standardized, you know, list of resources for people, um, faculty or, or senior residents could reference that when they're planning to give feedback to a, a, a younger learner um, or any coachee. Um, I think that could be really helpful. Yeah, Dr. Hartenbach. something um you know during my surgical career my goal was to just be continuously improving and in fact i remember interviewing for my first job and having my chair say well you can't go there because that person you know there's not a surgeon there that's already better than you you have to go somewhere where there's somebody better than you and so that you can continue learning and so um the opportunity now to 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 tape the tape these you know events these surgical events and then have a um, a skillful coach go over that with you. I just think, oh my God, mm -hmm. like how beautiful is that? Yeah. So I don't have thoughts beyond that, um, but I uh, and I think we do a lot of things well in the department. But I think there's some opportunity here. So thanks for bringing this forward. I have two questions about maybe something more detailed about how these kind of remote assessments worked. And I don't know if the literature really got into it, but, you know, as someone who's going to be in a much smaller practice than, you know, the ASAG group here, there aren't as many surgical coaches. And so these remote things sound mm -hmm. really interesting. Um, I am curious about how um, patients were approached about it. I assume they had to give consent to have their procedure recorded. So in, in the CSATs, which is the, um, the, one where you upload videos, mm -hmm. it's all de-identified. Okay. Um, so I don't, I don't believe patients are specifically consented for it because um, all of the possibly, you know, identifiable data is removed. I'm not a thousand percent sure about that. Fair. Okay. And then do you know, like for instance, with the Wisconsin specific program or these remote programs, generally speaking, like who funded these? Were they by grants as these were being like pursued? Was it the hospital where the surgeon was employed? Was it fees out of like the Wisconsin like surgical association? Some of them were actually done with in, I don't know exactly who funded them, but some of them were done with um, collaboration with insurance companies actually, because they were supposed to be quality improvement metrics. Um, so Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan was like the corporate partner for their surgical coaching program. All of these ones here are available you can do them individually. I'm, I'm, I know that they're expensive, mm -hmm. um, but there's also systems where your, either your society can invest in them or your organization or your department. So I think there's kind of multiple levels that you could get funding for them. And again, diverting some of the money that we spend on like going to conferences probably would be a really good investment. Thanks. Oh, yeah. Nope. Maya, this was a great talk. Thank you very much. Um, one of the things that I find really striking about the idea of surgical education over the span of a career is we have this time in residency that is very much identified as this point of learning that is you're drinking from the fire hose, you are getting the exposure that you will never get at any other point in your career. And the conceit of that is this combination of this intense learning period balanced with this idea of service. You know, we do a lot of, we spend a lot of our time in service of the hospital system, in service of the patients of that area, and what we get in return for relatively little pay in comparison to what we get for the rest of our career is this great educational experience. And so that's the carrot that we get for investing that. I'm curious what you think or what you have read as the additional carrots once you get out of this training period to invest in something like this, because as you mentioned, it's very expensive. And it sounds like there are already a couple of things 
such as insurance companies sponsoring it. But I'm just curious if you can go into a little bit more of what can we do to encourage people outside of this intense training period to really invest in something like this? I think um, one of the things that I mentioned is that coaching is only going to be successful when someone elects to participate in it. Um, so I think at the end of the day, the carrot is doing a better job and improving your outcomes and improving the care that you give to patients. Um, if that was tied to quality met, like quality outcomes, like time of surgery, rate of complications, rate of readmissions, there could be like a financial, you know, tie in there. Um, and that's probably, you know, equally motivating for some people. Um, but I think at the end of the day, the, the real carrot is just, we, you know, chose this field because we want to do this thing that's extremely challenging and is ever evolving. And so that idea of a personal best, I think is kind of the overhanging, overarching goal that I would identify as the carrot of surgical coaching. <laughs> Yeah, Dr. Sampene. Um, thanks, Maya. That was a really great talk. I, when you were speaking about the non-technical um, aspects in the OR, um, something that came to mind was um, like our experienced circulating nurses or experienced scrub techs um, and how much kind of they have seen in their lifetime and what they um, kind of view as how a good OR is run or not a, not a great experience or, you know, I think there's probably this like culture of like, yay, I get to be in Dr. So-and-so's OR today or like, oh man, I had to spend the whole day in this other OR today. I know um, that, that is true based yeah. on experience. And so it was coming to mind to me was like, I'm not sure if you mentioned it or I might've missed it, but like, if there is any um, programs that look at um, maybe like training um, an experienced um, OR circulator or tech as a coach to do um, that type of feedback, I would like kind of just inherently think that'd be really valuable for myself. Um, and maybe like something that like as a quality improvement initiative, maybe yeah. Meritor in the OR and things could be um, potentially interested in um, investing in. I don't think that that has been done. And I think that sounds like a fabulous idea. If um, just out of curiosity, if Meritor were interested in um, something like that, would, do you think one of the established programs would be a good one for the, um, a nurse or a circulator to be trained in, or would um, this be more physician oriented? I don't know a ton about any of these organizations, but it seems like maybe the Academy for Surgical Coaching would be the best one. Uh -huh. um, the SCOPE program is the only other like person-to-person -person coaching program on here. And that's more of like a one-to-one -one where you, you partner with another practitioner in your department. But I think the Academy for Surgical Coaching, which is conveniently, you know, based here somewhat, um, they, they talk about sort of um, tailoring things to, to what you want to do. And I think that could work and you could probably write a paper about it. Yeah. I, you know, there's the names that come to mind with a couple of folks in the OR that I'd be like, they should be my coach. Like they should, be, yeah. they should do this because it would be I, really Yeah. Great. That sounds yeah, great. Cool. Thanks, Maya. I was just going to say that one of the things that uh, in this, you know, thing of diversity is that a lot of people don't realize, like you presented a lot about white physicians, but the first actually cardiovascular surgeon was a black man. And, and probably the first female cardiovascular surgeon was a black woman. What did, did they have in terms of, did they have any different techniques of teaching physicians? Because they could not participate in the white system. Mm -hmm back then. I mean, they couldn't be part of, you know, uh, uh, I think the first female physician part of the American College of Surgery was African-American women. Uh, so how, how did that, do you, do you, did you come across anything in terms of that? Were they trained any differently because they were trained in a segregated way, but somehow they were some of the better surgeons? Yeah. Um, when I was researching sort of the history portion of the talk, um, a huge part that I left out is our longstanding and current history of discrimination in, in surgery and medicine in general. Um, so you're absolutely right that actually, you know, not until 19, 
after 1965, when um, the Civil Rights Act was passed, was there even, you know, rare integration of people of different colors and races in surgical fields. So um, the traditional model that's that the ACGME, the American College of Surgeons, and all of the, the board of um, OBGYN is all based on um, institutions that were created without the input of diverse learners and diverse teachers. Um, so really not, nothing that is in court, was incorporated before 1965 had the benefit of, of hearing from diverse voices. And I think that's a huge, huge detriment to obviously all of our, our expertise. Mm 